I will take up the first uh, question, which is the question for um, the artificial iris implant. And I'm quite um, interested to hear the uh, answers of the colleagues. Uh, in my opinion, this is twofold. First of all, the lack of iris is not the major, not the biggest problem of the child or of the adult with aniridia. It is the complications which make the problems really and which um, worsens the life situation during, during the years to come. Um, from, of course, from the, NS, from the aesthetic point of view, uh, some parents would like if they if there were an iris, but um, it is from the uh, it is don't overestimate the iris for the visual acuity. The child who has been born with aniridia has a macular hypoplasia and often has an optic nerve def, um, dysplasia and the left or the, 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 the missing iris is not the major problem for the, for the low vision. And therefore, I would not uh, advise to implant an artificial iris um, because apart from these aspects, there is this other aspect of um, provoking an um, aniridia fibrosis syndrome and to provoke the onset of glaucoma and to provoke the onset of cataract if you do it in an, in an eye with clear lens. Uh, often it is done uh, together with a lens extraction or a cataract or um, operation, but still um, it is the implantation of a foreign body with uh, pigment on it. And the pigment is known to disperse from the artificial iris and provoke uh, the glaucoma problems as well as the corneal problems. So I would advise against it. And I'm quite um, happy to hear some other comments now from the board. What about the, the colleague from Helmholtz Institute? Do you routinely implant artificial iris? Я полностью согласен с доктором. Мы не имплантируем радужку по той же причине, что существует большое количество рисков у ребенка, кроме отсутствия или наличия радужки, и та же глаукома, катаракты и так далее. Любое вмешательство в такой глаз, оно увеличивает риск развития дальнейших осложнений в несколько раз. Поэтому я считаю, что не стоит... Dr. Freeman? I agree that there is too much risk for the benefit. And it should only even be considered if you're doing cataract surgery because of opacity. I would highly uh, discourage it just for the sake of aesthetics. We uh, published the first paper on aneritic fibrosis syndrome, and our theory is that any device or any surgery that may rub the periphery of the anterior segment may increase the risk of aneritic fibrosis syndrome. And the more hardware in the eye, such as an Ahmed valve, such as a lens implant, can potentially increase the risk of this, and there appears to be an association with more intraocular surgery. So my initial instinct would be to say, not to do this device. However, having said this, I do know of a case in the United States where an artificial iris was used that was placed in the bag, and the patient, it really helped to her, her photophobia, and also helped her self-esteem. So my initial instinct is to have very great caution and to discourage the use of artificial irises in aniridia, but there are some benefits for some patients and, um, but I think it is not worth the risk. Thank you. Did you hear anything new you would like to tell us uh, on the conference in Triboksari? I did not see a lot of presentations on the artificial iris that are actually happening today, unfortunately. 
I did see some patients, and, and what I heard from talking to the doctors is that in traumatic aniridia, which is totally different from congenital aniridia, they've been using these devices since 1995, and they have some long follow-up with these. And I think in traumatic aniridia, they are useful and can be very helpful. I believe they stated in congenital aniridia, they have been used since 2005, and I did see some patients, maybe they showed me the best ones, I don't know, but that were looking good maybe eight years after the original surgery. To me, if the artificial iris is in the lens capsule and does not make significant contact with the peripheral structures, this is one thing. If it is in the sulcus and has peripheral contact, that is another thing. I'd worry about aneritic fibrosis syndrome. They in discussion with the doctors state they have not seen a lot of that. I also know that with lens implants in the United States, many times we have to fix the lens implant with a suture to the sclera, and this uh, provides a potential point of scarring or fibrosis to develop. But to prevent dislocation of the lens, there's not another way in, in our hands with our tools. Perhaps the artificial iris fixates the lens so it won't dislocate, and there may be an advantage there, but overall, I'm still very cautious uh, because of the potential for fibrosis. It is unclear what is the, uh, the rate of fibrosis and how often it occurs around the world. Would anyone else from this board here would like to say anything about artificial iris? And are there any more questions from the listeners concerning artificial iris implantation? Um, no? Then we go on to the second question, which I think is a bit a difficult question. Um, when patients with aniridia should have surgery and when not? Well, it depends. <laughs> This is what I can say. Um, it is, of course, the question why the surgery should be, should be performed and why and how urgent the thing is. I, on, on one of my slides, I wrote the, uh, every surgery which can be omitted is a, a win for the patient. This is true. But you have, of course, to decide when you can uh, not do a surgery. For example, if you have glaucoma and you cannot treat it with uh, drops and you have piling drops, one, two, three, five drops, and your cornea surface is getting less and less good, then you have not an option. You have to do the surgery for the sake of the eye. Um, so you always have to, to choose between the, the worst and the worst, so to speak and then try to make the best decision for the individual eye at the moment. Uh, for cataract surgery, I would say, um, as I said this morning, um, that um, the, the one, one good measurement is the age of the child and the, the question whether you can, as a physician, do retinoscopy or not. If you can do retinoscopy and you have a good a view into the uh, fundus of, in the back of the eye, and then uh, the, the cataract is not so much disturbing for the child that one should always remove it. Um, but if you have a dense cataract, and when you do not have a good uh, red reflex anymore from the back of the eye, and when you cannot do any retinoscopy more, anymore, and you have a child within the visual development phase of below uh, five years, then you should do the cataract surgery because then the child can do some more visual development. And then, of course, with all care which can be taken with a very small incision and without additional implants beside the lens uh, to correct the missing own lens. And, um, so it is always the weighing for uh, the best of the eye and of the care.
carrier of the eye of the person himself. Um, who would like to further comment on the um, And I want to, again to stress, because I've said this earlier, with nystagmus and strabismus surgery, these two surgeries are, of course, surgeries, uh, but they are ex extraocular surgeries, and they do not um, produce these complications as intraocular surgery does. And if a patient has a gross squint, cross-eyed, or divergent eyes, then it might be very good for the self-esteem of the patient to have these, uh, these position anomaly corrected. And in, in, in Iridia, there are only very few patients who have uh, abnormal head positions to dampen the nystagmus, but in those, this can be a very good way to help the patients as well. And from the technical point of view, uh, nystagmus dampening surgery is just like strabismus surgery. And you can do it and you, without putting the eye into any risk. Um, what about the question of when to do surgery and when not? What would the Helmholtz colleague like to say? If, um, or Dr. Freeman? Yeah. Hello? Okay. The, the one point that I think is very important, and maybe it's already been said today, I don't know, is glaucoma is the most important surgery in my mind because glaucoma damage cannot be undone by current technology. So the strategy of putting off surgery as long as you can, by our understanding, is not valid for glaucoma. If the pressure is high, too high, you'll have irreversible glaucoma damage. And then when the technology is better 10 years, 20 years later, we still may not be able to recover it. So of, of all the surgeries, if it is recommended, glaucoma surgery, in my mind, is the most important. Do you want to say? Я тоже поддержу доктора Фримана в плане того, что наиболее важным является повышение давления, повышенное давление глаукома при анаридии. По поводу катаракты, как сказала уважаемая Барбара, только слишком или далеко зашедшая зрелая катаракта может быть принята, так сказать, к рассмотрению, к операции. Пациенты очень тяжелые и глаза очень, я бы их назвал, хрупкие. Поэтому принимать решение о хирургии катаракты, тем более с имплантацией интраокулярной линзы, надо очень осторожно. И этих пациентов очень, на самом деле, мало оперированных и, так сказать, Надо семь раз, как говорят по-русски, семь раз отмерить, не один раз прооперировать. Спасибо. I agree, and this is why I, uh, why I said this morning, I think it is necessary for the Aniridia patients to get the best surgeons of the country. And I think it is not every house, speaking of uh, uh, hospital of ophthalmology or a university hospital, it, there is possibly not in every house is every surgeon for the aniridia patient. And perhaps the corneal surgeon sits there and the, the, the cataract surgeon sits there and there should be one person really telling the patients where to go for which kind of surgery just to get the best for the patient. Ну, я хочу добавить еще, что для хирургии катаракты есть такой критерий, это когда человек не теряет способность работать вблизи, да, то есть может быть читать, либо работать за компьютером, и эта способность нарушается очень сильно, да, и тогда может быть это показанием хирургии катаракты. Во всем остальном согласен, и иногда люди сами отказываются от хирургии, потому что они боятся что-то получить еще хуже зрения, чем у них сейчас есть. Вот. Спасибо.
I've noticed that as well, the if being afraid of things. And I didn't want to imply that we should wait until the cataract is mature and completely dense. Um, but of course, in children, it's often very difficult to, to decide because they can't, uh, we can't do the standard visual tests and they can't tell us that they can't read anymore because they still don't know how to read. And therefore, uh, I think the retinoscopy evaluation is quite a good one to see when the cataract is optically really disturbing and needs to be removed. Are there any more um, comments from the panel for cataract? Mm -hmm. what, what do you feel about, if you're doing cataract surgery, leaving them aphakic so they have the magnification from the, the spectacle correction? In, in my opinion, some of the aniridia patients are myopic, and then I do uh, leave them myophagic. Uh, that makes them wearing plus lenses, which enlarge the optical image. And uh, that, this is, of course, a discussion because you have the, the plus um, of the optical correction, but you have the lost. Um, border between anterior and posterior segment. What do you yourself would say to that? I think that um, if many times, unless you fixate the lens implant, you'll have a late dislocation. This can be one problem. And that by taking the capsule and leaving them aphakic and doing a vitrectomy, you, you may serve them well because they'll have the high plus power glasses that give the magnification and you may have reduced the risk of touch between a piece of hardware and the periphery. You have lost the anterior posterior division in the eye, but there perhaps is benefit and sometimes I wonder if we just do the lens implant because that's how we always do it for cataract surgery, but I think in aneritics it may be of benefit to have the high plus power and also for considerations like aneritic fibrosis syndrome. Are there any questions from the listeners concerning surgical points to do when what and when rather to refrain from surgery? Um, the third question is how to achieve normal IOP in aneurytic patients and medication. Um, I would like to know that. <laughs> it's one of the most difficult problems, as you know, and as Dr. Freeman said, um, it is the problem that cataract can be removed and corneas can be transplanted, transplanted or it can, at uh, the last stage, give uh, an artificial cornea, but the damage done to the optic nerve cannot be undone. So it is really important to get a good grip to the intraocular pressure. And in children, it is uh, the, the usual um, of, uh, intraocular pressure of 20, which we say is normal for adults, is still is already a bit high for children, in fact. So my dream intraocular pressure for children with aniridia would be 12 to 15. And um, with the eye medication, of course, you always have to take the preservative-free medications, and you have to see whether the medications do not have any effect on the systemic feelings of the child. Some do lower the blood pressure, make the, feel, uh, make the child feel tired. So you have to evaluate that because children are more sensitive to the systemic side effects of the eye drops than adult persons are. Uh, it's the same dosage and you're giving it to a small child of, of 25 kilos and you're giving it to a larger man of 150 kilos. So um, this has to be taken in mind and of course the, the super, uh, the, the corneal surface has to be taken in mind due to the repetitive uh, giving of medications. Um, which might not be good for the corneal surface. May I just transfer the question to Dr. Friedman to, for his um, point of view concerning that question? About control of glaucoma with the medicines. I, I, I basically use preservative-free 
and then I defer everything else to my glaucoma colleagues. But it, it's the, the intraocular pressure control is critical, and uh, you, how we do it in the United States is you use medicines till you no longer can achieve adequate intraocular pressure control, and then you have to go to surgery, and that's the, the basic approach. I think, Helena, you, you really posed the questions where you quite frankly knew or, or know that these are the, the critical questions, really. And I hope you didn't expect us to suddenly have all the answers. I mean, we didn't have all the answers before, and so we're not going to have answers today, which is a pity, but it is like that.